Well, thank you, Liz, and good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you and uh, a special honor to be kicking off the technical talks at your symposium. Uh, I had thought that I was going to have the uh, uh, display on the screen in front of me as well as the one that's on the wall over here, but maybe we can still do that. That looks better. Thank you very much. So, uh, folks, this is not going to be a uh, latest and greatest kind of talk. Rather, it's going to be a retrospective. Um, I want to uh, lead you through the uh, uh, long path between uh, Einstein having written down the field equations of his general theory of relativity in 1915 and the discovery uh, in 2015, 100 years later, uh, that you're going to hear about in, in some detail tomorrow. So I'm going to tell you some of the things that happened in between, uh, and that includes uh, the work that Liz just referred to, uh, having to do with an uh, orbiting pulsar. So the, an overview of, of what's to come is uh, I'm going to talk about pulsars. I'm going to talk about uh, these objects, which uh, are, have sometimes been referred to as nature's most precise clocks, and their relationship to uh, the gravitational waves. Seemingly some very different topics here, but uh, they do converge, in fact, toward a uh, major discovery in physics. Uh, the one that uh, you're going to hear about tomorrow in Nergis Mavavala's uh, plenary lecture. So the approach here is going to be historical, it's going to be personal and anecdotal in, in, uh, in some places. Um, uh, uh, some bits and pieces of things that happened uh, over all these years going back uh, just a little over one century now. So let's start with neutron stars. Um, these objects um, uh, are not something which has ever been observed directly, uh, uh, that is by photography or some other uh, method that you normally think of in astronomy, uh, but they uh, arose originally purely theoretically only a couple of years after the discovery of the particle, uh, the neutron, uh, by Chadwick in 1932. So Walter Botta and Fritz Zwicky in 1934 wrote a paper, a very short paper, in which they said, with all reserve, we advance the view that a supernova represents the transition of an ordinary star into a new form of star, the neutron star, the end point of stellar evolution. Such a star may possess a very small radius and an extremely high density. A few years later, uh, Oppenheimer and uh, his student Volkoff uh, worked out the, what the structure of a neutron star would have to be, basically writing down uh, equations which would lead them to an understanding of the equation of state of nuclear matter in bulk, uh, which is what the structure of a neutron star is guided by. Then, of course, the war came, and uh, science sort of came to a halt for uh, uh, fundamental science purposes uh, for some time. But uh, after the war, uh, astronomy and astrophysics got started again uh, with uh, a number of technological advances, needless to say, and uh, Riccardo Giacconi and his colleagues uh, uh, discovered an object which appeared to have no astrophysical interpretation that would uh, uh, be satisfied by any object uh, less dense than this hy than hypothetical neutron star type of object. So it looked as though the x-rays that they detected in the constellation Scorpius uh, might very likely be arising from the infall of uh, interstellar material uh, onto the surface of something as dense as the hypothesized neutron star. A few years later after that, uh, the first pulsar was discovered by uh, astronomers in Cambridge, England. Uh, the remarkable uh, radio sources which emit uh, brief pulses of uh, broadband radio noise, uh, which keep time very well. Uh, and uh, even in the very first set of observations, it was recognized that uh, these objects, which came to be called pulsars within uh, uh, only a year or so, uh, kept time uh, remarkably accurately, at least apart in 10 to the 7. And uh, within a very short time, it was discovered that they keep time even very much better than that. In fact, by uh, within a uh, little more than a year after the first discovery, a few dozen pulsars were known. Uh, and the number was slowly climbing. 
uh, radio astronomers were hot on the trail of these objects. It was discovered that in general they uh, do slow down gradually, uh, but that the rate of change of the uh, period, which turns out to be associated with the rotation of the neutron star, uh, was something like a part in 10 to the 15. Uh, dp by dt was something like 10 to the minus 15, give or take an order of magnitude or so. So these are very accurate uh, clocks, spinning flywheels, if you like, uh, the favored model already within uh, uh, a year or so of the discovery was that these objects are uh, rapidly spinning, strongly magnetized neutron stars, uh, which are created in these super, supernova explosions, which um, had been predicted by uh, Bada and Zwicky. So here's a, uh, an astronomical photograph, just to give a little bit of astronomical flavor to these things. Uh, this is the so-called Crab Nebula, just because of its shape, roughly the shape of a crab, I suppose. Uh, this, in fact, was an object, uh, it is the gaseous remains of an object that was observed as a bright uh, thing in the sky that hadn't been there before by astronomers in the Far East uh, in uh, the year 1054 in the Common Era. Uh, in fact, I am told that the uh, dating appears to be that they first saw it on the 4th of July, uh, which is a good time for a supernova to go off, at least by our <laughs> modern reckoning in this country. Uh, so look near the center of this uh, crab-shaped uh, system of stuff, uh, seen as with stars in the foreground and background, and you'll see a particular uh, object, a, a star, pointed to by the arrow there, which turns out to be if you photograph it with uh, high time resolution in a series of, uh, of snapshots, uh, you, it turns out to be uh, a blinking object which blinks on and off 30 some times per second. It's a pulsar. It's a rapidly rotating, strongly magnetized neutron star spinning around, sending out a beam of stuff. Uh, this one, unlike most radio frequency detected pulsars, is also detected uh, as an optical object. Its mass is something like 40% greater than that of the sun. Its radius is probably about 10 kilometers. It's got a strong magnetic field, 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 13 or so Gauss uh, for, uh, for different pulsars. We can make these estimates by measuring at, uh, the uh, measurable parameters, including the uh, spin-down rate, which gives some indication of the uh, breaking on the rotational uh, kinetic energy uh, caused by simply by magnetic dipole radiation. So there's the, uh, the, the, the physicist's sketch, a cartoon sketch. Notice that the, uh, the fastest rotating objects rotate so quickly that the uh, distance out to the point at which co-rotation with the uh, mag magnetic field would occur at the speed of light is not a very great distance. Uh, the most rapidly spinning pulsars known are rotating at about 700 hertz, 700 rotations per second. Uh, so the light cylinder is not that far away, and obviously a lot of things happen in here which uh, need to be uh, dealt with with relativistic physics. Okay, so a little bit more about pulsar history as we go along through this story. In the early 1970s, there were many pulsar surveys underway, uh, including the one that I started with my then first graduate student. I was a young assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts. We got some modest funding to uh, buy a, what, what then was called a mini computer, <laughs> it was about the size of a refrigerator, uh, uh, to uh, sample the data rapidly from the radio telescope and uh, allow us to do some data processing to sort out the, the signal from the noise. The UMass Arecibo uh, Pulsar Survey was started. Now Arecibo, as you know, is the uh, city near which the world's largest radio telescope is located a 1,000-foot uh, diameter spherical reflecting uh, telescope uh, lying uh, on its back, pointed directly up in, in the air. And 400 feet above the uh, center of the dish uh, is this triangular support structure holding uh, antennas which pick up the incoming signal. The uh, telescope is steerable only by moving the, the uh, uh, antennas at the focal point uh, around, and so it can be steered to within any, any angle within about 20 degrees of straight up. So you get a limited view of the sky, plus or minus 20 degrees in, in declination from the latitude of Puerto Rico, which is about plus 18 degrees. That means you can survey the astronomical sky from about zero to plus 40, more or less, uh, degrees of declination. And uh, 
and you follow a particular object as it crosses the sky due to Earth rotation uh, for a couple of hours uh, each day. The basic technology, as you can see, is uh, not too different from that of suspension bridges. <laughs> Those tall towers hold cables which hold up the uh, multi-ton structure which holds the feed antennas. The, you can actually walk down on the valley floor underneath the antenna. There, there are, uh, you can see ordinary vegetation growing. The, the surface panels are made of perforated aluminum sheet with, uh, and the tropical rains and sunshine go right through it. Lots of vegetation growing on the valley floor. You can see uh, regularly spaced uh, what look like tree stumps there. Those are the concrete anchors in the ground which have cables tied to the uh, to the suspended surface to keep it uh, uh, in its uh, through reflecting shape. The accuracy of the surface is something like two millimeters RMS. So you can see that the frequency range at which this telescope is useful goes up to something like eight or 10 gigahertz um, with some loss of sensitivity at the highest frequencies. Here's a close up of the uh, antennas near the uh, focal point. As you can see, there's a radome that encloses in fact another uh, uh, reflecting surface, an upside down surface uh, like a, it's not parabolic, but uh, parabolic, but uh, another shape that does appropriate shaping. Uh, that, that's about 25 meters in diameter looking down at the dish and then there's a tertiary uh, point at which all the uh, signals come to a focus. Uh, so, and receivers inside the radome then would pick up the signal. On the other end of the curved track underneath the circular structure, uh, you see a, a long stinger sort of an antenna. That is the, uh, uh, it's basically a long leaky waveguide, almost 100 feet long uh, at uh, a particular frequency, 430 megahertz, has, has the highest sensitivity of any of the, uh, of the uh, receiving antennas on the telescope. And that is in fact the one that we used for de detecting uh, the pulsar survey that I'm going to be talking about. You probably have seen this antenna uh, before, and uh, it shows up in movies from time to time. It's there in the movie Contact and, and uh, uh, in, in one of the James Bond movies. That James Bond chases the bad guy out along that, uh, that, that uh, catwalk, and uh, mayhem ensues. <laughs> Here's a picture taken from the, uh, from the platform. You can go up there and and uh, look around and adjust the receiver or whatever. We often go up after a night's observing and uh, watch the sun come up over the North Atlantic, which is just off to the top of the photograph there. And then you can walk down again. You can ride up to the platform in a cable car and walk down again along this catwalk that goes back down to the, uh, to the laboratory. There's looking up into the, uh, into the radome full of uh, all the electronics. And uh, here we are at night, and I, I uh, forgot to talk to the AV folks to see whether we we're going to be able to play you this uh, this noise but if you've been in Puerto Rico at night uh, you might be familiar with this noise if we're going to hear it I'm not sure if we are or not um, I didn't hear anything oh maybe I have to push over here ah one more, one more try <laughs> No. Well, this is not going to work, folks. I'm sorry. Um, I should have checked that in advance. Uh, what I would have played for you were the tree frogs that you hear in Puerto Rico after a rain, <laughs> the coqui. They are a beautiful sound and uh, music to my ears uh, from many, time, many uh, nights spent in Puerto Rico. So in the early 1970s, a number of people were doing pulsar surveys, including ourselves. Uh, our survey began in, in uh, late 1973. By uh, the middle of 1974, uh, my student Russell Hulse and I had already found 40 new pulsars, more or less doubling the number of pulsars that were known at the time. We were setting out to uh, see how these objects, known as pulsars, are scattered out throughout our galaxy to see how their distribution would be uh, uh, co uh, compared with the uh, types of stars from which we thought supernovae probably uh, would be created. Um, in the modest proposal written to the National Science Foundation, which funded this project, uh, I mentioned the fact that uh, it would be of 
particular importance to find even one example of a pulsar uh, gravitationally bound to another stellar object so that it was orbiting and we could measure its Doppler shifts and by doing so would be able to measure or at least closely, closely estimate uh, the mass of a neutron star, an object of significant uh, physical importance. And sure enough, in uh, the July of 1974, uh, Russ Hulse, who was doing the observations at the time, uh, told me that he found an object which appeared to be a pulsar, but his period wasn't constant. It kept changing. Day after day, he reobserved it and found the period to be slightly different from the day before. And in fact, plotting up his observations over a couple of weeks uh, turned out to give us a so-called velocity curve that what's being plotted here is the radial velocity estimated from the Doppler shift as a function of the orbital phase over, a, over a, I've shown one and a half orbits there over, a, it turns out the orbital period was just a little bit less than eight hours. And that was one of the reasons, by the way, that it took a while for us to figure out what was going on because, of course, we could only observe the object for a couple of hours each day and a day later that was more or less three orbits later, the pulsar would be back almost in the same part of its orbit. So it took a couple of weeks to, uh, to measure the whole orbital phase. If you can see the numbers there, you'll see that the maximum velocity with respect to uh, uh, the center of mass of the system is 300 kilometers per second. That's a tenth of one percent of the speed of light, folks. This is big velocity <laughs> we're talking about. Uh, a massive object, the mass of the sun, moving around another object uh, also, obviously, something close to the mass of the sun, or a bit more, um, at mildly relativistic velocities. Here's Russ Hulse in the control room in the Arecibo uh, Observatory, pushing buttons on the, uh, the computer that we were so fond of, uh, and, um, and detecting this and, and uh, a number of other pulsars. So the basic system that we found that we had discovered had a uh, a rotational period of 59 milliseconds, so about 16 pulses per second. Uh, the period of the binary system, there P with a subscript B, was a little less than eight hours. The eccentricity of the orbit was quite high. This is an elongated elliptical orbit. You can tell that from the fact that the velocity curve was nothing like sinusoidal. It had a lot of harmonic content. Uh, the maximum orbital velocity, about 10 to the minus 3C. It was clear that the unseen companion around which this pulsar must be orbiting must be a compact object because the size of the orbit was only about equal to the radius of the sun. Therefore, if the, if the other object had been a main sequence star, something like the sun, they would be, in the first place, almost in contact. The pulsar would surely disappear for half of the orbit as it went behind the other object. Uh, there would be, probably be some plasma effects and other things, none of which we observed. So it's clear the other object was uh, another compact object, probably another neutron star estimating from the masses. Although still at this time, neutron stars were sort of only barely known objects. We had some theory about them, but not much more than that. It was clear that uh, because pulsars keep time so well, we should be able to measure effects that turn up in the, in the uh, Doppler measurements at order v over c squared, or even higher uh, powers of, of that ratio, so that relativistic effects are going to be important here. We're going to need to analyze the, the uh, dynamics of this system uh, with using relativistic gravity. We should expect, in fact, from general relativity, that the direction in which the major axis of this uh, elliptical orbit points should rotate gradually with time, the so-called advance of the periastron, analogous to the advance of perihelion of the planets, which was well known already uh, in the solar system. Uh, it was also uh, noted uh, within a couple of weeks after the system had been discovered and the news started getting out uh, by the astronomical grapevine, it had been pointed out to us that this system should radiate gravitational waves uh, according to Einstein's theory, uh, at a rate that would change the period of the orbit by a possibly measurable rate, a, a measurable amount. Uh, it was not clear that that should be measurable, but it was clear that it might be, and that if so, it would be an important measurement. So here's what we were uh, left with sort of as, as a sketch. 
Notice that I'm showing you things that were originally prepared as view graphs back when the technology was rather different. <laughs> and so a lot of these are my own sketches from a, a number of years ago found in an old filing cabinet. So the size of this orbit, two things going around each other, each of them very small. They're, the size of the orbit is about the size of the sun, 10 to the 6 kilometers in round numbers. It should be emitting gravitational waves. And according to relativity theory, the orbit should shrink by about one millimeter per orbit. Uh, okay, the orbital size is, is 10 to the 6 kilometers, and we're talking about a change of that. Well, it doesn't look like it's very promising, but on the other hand, clocks are very uh, precise things, and if you do a timekeeping experiment here, just conceivably that might be measurable. So let me turn the clock back here now for a minute. Uh, Einstein's equations uh, for general relativity, first written down in 1915. Here he is, nice looking young man with all these bright ideas coming along. And uh, he already had worked out within another year of publishing the, the uh, basic field equations that uh, gravitational waves should exist. This is a field theory, rather like other field theories, uh, like electromagnetism, for example. And uh, there must be some important questions here. Uh, whether gravitational waves should exist. And it's an important theoretical question to see whether, basically to see whether um, the theory predicts that. Uh, it's a non-linear uh, non theory, so it's not quite as straightforward as, as uh, it might have been otherwise. The mathematics is a bit more complicated. Um, in any case, we worked out that uh, theoretically these waves should exist. And then, of course, it became important to understand whether experimentally that could be tested because then we could find out whether this theory is on the right track or not. So within a couple of years he'd actually worked out something which has come to be called the quadrupole formula in this field. Uh, a simple uh, way of, of estimating the rate of energy loss from a system um, in the linearized uh, so-called slow motion weak field approximation of the theory. It won't give us the whole story uh, in the case of two black holes colliding that we're going to hear about tomorrow, I expect. Uh, but it will be useful in a case like the binary pulsar, uh, where the motions are only mildly relativistic and the uh, uh, separations are such that we're not talking about uh, being right at the edge of, of where things really go nonlinear in the theory. Eddington worked out some additional uh, aspects of this and, and uh, published these things in 1924, but there was not much other uh, interest in the possibility of gravitational waves for a long time, in part because, as Einstein worked out, uh, the uh, prospects for any uh, experimental uh, attack on this problem were pretty dismal. And here is again one of these sketches I made some years ago, decades ago, about uh, what Einstein was talking about in one of these 1916-1918 papers. He worked out what it would be like to make a CW transmitter for gravitational waves. And as a model, he imagined a, a big motor spinning a massive bar uh, and calculated what the power transmitted in gravitational waves should be. And if you make that bar out of steel, make its radius to be one meter, say, its length to be 20 meters, mass would be around about 500 tons, spin it at uh, a rate so just short of the tensile strength of steel being, <laughs> being exceeded, uh, something like 30 radians per second was a, was a possibility. Uh, it turns out the luminosity in gravitational waves is something like uh, 10 to the no minus 29 watts, uh, 10 to the minus 22 ergs per second I wrote down there. So this is a, a, a dismal prospect. We're not going to get any power out of this system. We're not going to be able to do a Hertz-like experiment and generate electromagnetic waves on one side of the lab and pick them up on the other side. That's not going to work. The, the reason, of course, is because big G, Newton's constant of gravitation, is in the numerator. That's a very small number. And C is in the denominator, and it's to the fifth power. <laughs> so th that's, that's bad news. But astronomically, things are, are much better. Uh, if you think of a couple of stellar mass objects orbiting each other in a binary star orbit, and use Kepler's law to eliminate, eliminate a couple of the parameters there, uh, it turns out that the gravitational wave luminosity of an orbiting pulsar system with, with parameters comparable to that of the uh, binary pulsar we discovered 
turns out to be more like 10 to the plus 31 ergs per second. The luminosity of the sun is only 10 to the minus, uh, 10 to the plus 32 something. So this is getting comparable to the luminosity of the sun. Um, but this is in gravitational waves, not electromagnetic radiation. Well, then uh, back in the 30s, Einstein, of course, has now left uh, Nazi Germany, and he's in, he's in Princeton. And uh, here he is at his desk at the Institute for Advanced Study, but he's beginning to worry about whether gravitational waves really exist. Um, so there's some clouds on the horizon, at least in his mind, and I want to lead you through some of the thought processes that were going on there. Um, he he uh, wrote a paper with a young assistant, Nathan Rosen, and submitted it to the Physical Review in 1936, in which they concluded that gravitational waves do not exist, that they're just a uh, an artifact of the uh, of the uh, the way the equations had been written down and, and parameterized. Um, the coordinate system, if you like, that was used. As it turned out, uh, the paper was uh, refereed, and the re uh, reviewer basically pointed out a number of mistakes in the, in the paper as submitted. The uh, physical review of editor sent it back to Einstein with a very polite letter saying, I hope you'll consider the <laughs> comments that the referee has made, blah, blah, blah. Einstein was outraged that his paper was uh, <laughs> was being challenged, and it turned out um, basically wrote back a handwritten note to the Physical Review uh, editor John Tate, saying, "I did not send my paper to you uh, to be sub uh, submitted to criticism. I sent it to you to be published." And <laughs> and uh, but but uh, anyway, Tate. Tate did not back down, and, and Einstein withdrew the paper. Uh, it turns out the referee was right, and, and the paper was wrong. Uh, and the, the paper was published a year later with the corrections made, uh, published in the Journal of the Franklin Institute, a, a relatively minor <laughs> outlet. And Einstein was a, had been so outraged by this that uh, he never published in the Physical Review again. But uh, it. In, in his uh, defense, I will mention that uh, at the time it was not the, uh, the tradition in uh, the European scientific literature, in particular in the German scientific literature, which was the most distinguished at the time, uh, to do this, this sort of reviewing. Uh, he was not used to having a paper uh, submitted to a referee. I guess he got used to it after that. Um, at any rate, then the war came along, as I had mentioned, and things uh, didn't progress much. But uh, in the 1950s, after the war, people started paying some attention once again to uh, the uh, uh, nature of gravitation. And uh, papers by Bondi and Feynman in the 1950s, and some, in particular discussion at a public meeting held in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, in 57, uh, led to a widespread agreement that uh, definitely uh, gravitational waves do exist, at least if, according to this theory, and if the theory is correct, conceivably we might observe them sometime. But at this time, there was still not yet any uh, experimental work that seemed to uh, have uh, great promise of reaching the sensitivities that would be necessary. So here's Feynman and Bondi uh, making those conclusions. Let us go on. Um, so. There are two questions uh, I think that are sort of uh, going to occupy me now for the next 10 minutes or so. One has to do with whether the theory, uh, this nonlinear theory of gravitation of Einstein's, uh, actually predicts waves that would carry uh, energy and angular momentum conceivably over, over large distances, sort of the way radio waves or light waves do. but of the gravitational field rather than, than the electromagnetic one. And um, then secondly, whether they can be detected. But one of the, one of the theoretical questions is surely going to be, uh, is this quadrupole formula of the, the uh, approximation made for the weak field slow motion case uh, actually uh, rigorously a consequence of the nonlinear theory? How much mathematical rigor should we be insisting on? And in that respect, I want to read to you a quotation made uh, of a statement made by Feynman at this uh, 1957 meeting in Chapel Hill. Feynman said, there exists, however, one serious difficulty in the study of relativistic gravity, and that is the lack of experiments. 
Furthermore, we're not going to get any, any experiments, so we have to take a viewpoint of how to deal with problems with no experiments are available. There are two choices. The first choice is that of mathematical rigor. People who work in gravitational theory believe that the equations are more difficult than in any other field. And from my viewpoint, this is false. If you then ask me to solve the equations, I must say that I can't solve them in the other fields either. <laughs> However, one can do an enormous amount by various approximations which are non-rigorous and unproved mathematically, perhaps for the first few years. Historically, the rigorous analysis of whether what one says is true or not comes many years later, after, dis after the discovery of what is true. And the discovery of what is true is helped by experiments. The attempt at mathematically rigorous solutions without guiding experiments is exactly the reason why the subject is difficult, but not the equations. The second choice of action is to play games by intuition and drive on. Take the case of gravitational radiation. Most people here think it exists, think it is likely that this radiation is emitted. So, suppose it is, and calculate various things, such as the scattering of stars, etc., and continue until you reach an inconsistency. Then go back and find out what is the difficulty. Make up your mind which way it is and calculate without rigor in an exploratory way. You have nothing to lose. There are no experiments. I think the best viewpoint is to pretend that there are experiments and calculate. In this field, since we are not pushed by experiment, we must be pulled by imagination. So, some people did just what he was proposing. His colleagues Peters and Matthews at Caltech wrote a paper just a few years later in which they began by saying uh, whether the, the question, well they said the question has been raised whether the energy so calculated has any physical meaning. We shall not concern ourselves with this equation here. But you know, then they go on and do the calculation. And in fact, the calculation that they made is the one that was necessary for us to evaluate the rate at which the orbital period of the binary pulsar should be changing. Because unlike the simple quadrupole formula, which assumed circular motion, they actually included uh, an eccentricity of a gravitationally bound pair of, uh, of uh, stellar mass objects moving around each other. So then what about experiments? Well, around about this same time in the 60s, Joseph Weber had started uh, making a, a gravitational wave antenna with a big aluminum bar. You probably are familiar with uh, the story of Joe Weber. It's kind of a sad story in a way. He was a very gifted experimentalist, uh, but in fact was duped by, uh, uh, in, uh, well, basically thought he had, had made detections of signals which turned out to be nobody else could, could confirm. And it's clear that Weber's experiments were, uh, were measuring something, but it was not uh, gravitational waves. That gave the, uh, the field something of a bad name because it, it had a, uh, a lot of excitement associated with it for a short time, but uh, nobody else could, could repeat the experiments. At the same time, uh, theoretical work was going on trying to uh, more uh, firmly establish whether the uh, approximation calculations that were being done were in fact valid extrapolations uh, from the theory. And in fact, that uh, turned out to be uh, essentially uh, a settled problem by the mid 80s, give or take, uh, a few years around 1983 or so. So let me go back now to the binary pulsar experiment itself, the, the clock comparison experiment. And I've got to compare my own clock here a little bit because I know we're getting on and we'll need to do coffee soon. So here we are, uh, something, uh, that's Puerto Rico down in the bottom there, and, and uh, the binary pulsar, something like 25,000 light years away in our galaxy, an orbiting pair of stars, uh, and uh, we're going to try to make uh, measurements of that and find the Doppler shifts or the, the equivalents thereof. So here's a block diagram of the way we, we envisioned the experiment. Uh, incoming signals from the antenna mixed down to lower, lower frequencies, uh, some spectral analysis done to sort out the interstellar dispersion that I'll re relate to a little bit more in a minute. Uh, then basically uh, averaging the signal uh, synchronized to the rotation period of the pulsar so that we get an average pulse waveform uh, recorded at each one of a number of radio frequencies closely spaced to each other. And then there's a bunch of stuff in, the, in this uh, simplified block diagram 
connected by green lines. All those green lines are connected things that have to do with time and frequency in the experiment, and that's the reason why I guess this is an appropriate talk for this audience. <laughs> uh, the time and frequency aspects of it are the critical aspects which gave it uh, the uh, high accuracy that was required. We needed to uh, transfer time to the observatory by means of, uh, actually we first did it with Loran C in the uh, years in the 1970s and early into the 80s and then converted over to GPS when that was a, a possibility. Here is the uh, actual waveforms as recorded by the system uh, at each one of a few frequencies between 1383 and 1423 megahertz. You can actually see the little wiggles. They add up at the end of the uh, day after removing the interstellar dispersion there which causes the velocity of propagation through the interstellar medium to be weakly frequency dependent. And there at the bottom you can see the double peaked uh, profile of this particular pulsar's waveform. So in order to make sense of this, in order to do the, the necessary gravitational physics, we need to convert from the pulsar frame to the observatory frame in an appropriate way. And I've written the equations down there. You don't need to pay much attention to them. But notice that there are a small number of uh, uh, parameters uh, listed there in handwriting over at the right, which characterize the, uh, the orbit. And I'm going to describe those to you in a little more detail in just a minute. Anyway, then we do go basically through a calculation which involves taking the topocentric or observatory-centered pulse times of arrival, or TOAs. We uh, adjust for any clock corrections of our local clock relative to the NIST standard, which we were using, by means of the, the best time transfer we could use. Uh, we put in a relativistic model of the solar system because uh, one of the bunches of equations here, the one, uh, the second equation, delta E, are the relativistic terms in this uh, time transfer that needs to be done. We need to put in Earth rotation data because the Earth doesn't rotate at a constant rate quite. It's almost constant, but after all, there's a molten core and oceans and atmosphere sloshing around, and so it's not quite constant. We need to know exactly where the observatory was at the time we made the observations, and that depends on the Earth rotation. That's easy to do, by the way. You probably know. You, you subscribe to the International Earth Rotation Service Bulletin B, and uh, it used to be every couple of weeks we'd get a thing in the mail. Now we get it by email if we're doing these things. At any rate, uh, so out of this come the uh, model parameters of the Pulsar system and a bunch of uh, post-fit residuals that allow us to, to estimate the errors in the experiment. So across the top of that slide, you see the so-called Keplerian parameters of this orbit. There are five of them. The projected size of the orbit, A sine i, the period of the binary system, the eccentricity, the angle of the major axis with respect to the line of nodes, and some reference time at which the pulsar and its companion object come at, uh, at their closest point of approach. Uh, you can use those to calculate something which has to do with the masses, but notice that I'm using here in that equation uh, physicists' uh, numbers, relativist number uh, um, units in which the speed of light and the constant of gravity are set equal to one. So those things are sort of uh, effaced out of the equations. In this system, then, you measure uh, everything in, in units of seconds. So the mass of the sun turns out to be 4.9 microseconds okay, in, in this system. Well, it turns out that of the post-Keplerian, or uh, parameters that uh, would not be necessary in a purely Keplerian description of the orbit, but are necessary in relativity, there are a number of additional parameters. And I've written the biggest five of them down there. The rate of change of the uh, direction of the major axis, omega dot, a parameter we call gamma, which has in it the uh, gravitational redshift and uh, transverse uh, second order Doppler effects. The rate of change of the orbital period, PB, with a dot over it. And then a couple of parameters that characterize the delay of the signal from the pulsar uh, when it's around on the back side of the orbit as, it, as the signal propagates through the gravitational field of its companion, the so-called Shapiro delay. 
those parameters uh, all in principle can be measured and each one depends in a way in which I've described in those equations on uh, the Keplerian parameters in a straightforward way. That is, there's an equation that um, relates each one of the relativistically measurable parameters to parameters of the Keplerian system. And so uh, the, the unknowns on the right-hand sides of those equations include measurable quantities and the two masses, M1 and M2, the mass of the pulsar and the mass of the other star. Everything else is measurable or, or known. So these equations, each, each of those equations defines a curve in a plane in which the two axes are the mass of the pulsar along the bottom axis and the mass of the thing around which it's orbiting, the companion star on the vertical axis. And these curves had better all intersect at one point, and if the theory is right, because that point then gives us the masses of the two objects. As you can see to the, to the accuracy at which the measurements can be made, which for the solid lines are quite, are very good, are comparable in fact to the width of the lines, uh, they do make it a point, just as they should. The dashed lines are in principle measurable, but not yet measurable, in this in this system to uh, very high accuracy. So I've driven uh, drawn the lines there as they should be rather than as they have been actually measured. Well, th that uh, graph was actually made, uh, what, 25 years ago or something now, and, and uh, even better accuracies are available today, but I'm not going to go into that in any greater detail. Let me just uh, summarize uh, the point where we are now by saying that uh, what was really of greatest interest was to measure this parameter PB dot, the time rate of change of the orbital period. And here it is plotted out as a uh, accumulative shift of the periastron time over years, starting from the first observations in late 1974 up until uh, just a few years ago. Um, we already, by uh, 1978, had started to see a little bit of curvature in this line and it said that we measured what appears to be gravitational radiation damping. That was that announcement was made at a meeting in uh, in Munich, Germany actually in, in late 1978. But uh, this clearly, uh, as you can see from this graph, is an experiment that reward, rewards patience. The longer you wait, the bigger the effect gets and it, and, and it grows quadratically with time. And as you can see, it, it agrees extremely well with the general relativistic prediction. Um, that would, I, I mean, as you can see, by the 1990s, uh, sort of halfway across that graph, the accuracy was already very high at the 1% level or so. Uh, here is a, uh, a picture from the New York Times science page on Tuesday, February 27, 1990, saying that uh, the LIGO experiment uh, has been recommended for funding by uh, the National Science Foundation, the National Science Board, and by the Bush administration. So it looks as though this may actually happen one of these days. Uh, and uh, that was a big step forward, in part uh, uh, could be justified and, and so forth by the fact that the binary pulsar experiment had by that time shown clearly that gravitational waves exist as predicted in general relativity and that therefore the predicted, uh, calculated uh, sizes of signals that might be uh, generated in gravitational waves from astronomical systems uh, was a fairly secure uh, prediction at that point. So let me just finish by fast forwarding to today. Uh, at this time there are something like 250 binary pulsars known. Uh, most of them are uh, a pulsar orbiting around a white dwarf star. Uh, but there are another uh, handful, another, I think a total of nine now, neutron star, neutron star pairs like the, the first one that we found. So we were somewhat lucky to find one as good for the purpose that we put it to as it was. Relativistic effects are measurable in many of these binary pulsar systems. There are now not just this one, but four other uh, measurements of orbital decay, all of which are in good agreement with general relativity. Importantly, there are also a number of measurements where there is no observed orbital decay, and in those cases the prediction is that there should be no measurable uh, rate of orbital decay. The orbit is too circular or too wide uh, to generate enough that would change the orbit over, over time. So it's clear that there are not other effects 
uh, affecting these as well. There are other, a handful of other tests based on other measurable post-Keplerian parameters, and it's uh, very clear that uh, this is going to be a, a, a time when we should be looking forward to the detection of gravitational waves uh, by these gigantic laser interferometer antennas known as LIGO, and we're going to hear that happy uh, story tomorrow morning at this time, I think. So I thank you very much for your attention, folks.